Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on Disney's Maleficent. Oh, uh, so this is like the second, third time you've seen this movie? Second. I went and saw it in theaters when it came out. I went by myself. Yes, I'm that kind of loser. <laughs> no, you're not. You just really wanted to see it, and you never get the opportunity to see it with anyone, so. Yeah. And the plus side was, it was actually a movie where I didn't feel the need to throw popcorn at people. Because it's one of the reasons I don't go to the movies. Because nobody shuts up. And I tried not to talk through my first viewing. <laughs> but there were a couple of times where I went, plot device incoming! Yes, because since the movie came up during our live action Beauty and the Beast recording, we figured, eh, why not make Lux watch it? And then we can record about it. Yep. And then we can go back to ponies because that should be coming up soon. Yes. So we've managed to survive hiatus. Yay! Yes, we get to live to see more ponies in the movie when that comes out in October. And as I said before, who knows if we get a chance to see that one in the theaters. We'll give you our thoughts on it when we actually get a chance to see it. No saying when. Ah, so I guess I'll start since it was my first time watching this. I actually liked all the twists and the CG and all the fancy stuff. I thought it worked rather well. And I only saw some of the twists coming. And even though the movie came out after Frozen, it was written most likely before Frozen, though it is the same company that was doing it, so I don't know if things were being tossed around at the time of writing. Yes, the that true love is not necessarily romantic love. Because it didn't feel like they rewrote and refilmed stuff to make it fit. It all fit anyways. So even though it's the same concept, I can see why people went, yeah, they took that from Frozen. I'm like, well, technically these movies take years to make, so it probably was around the same time. You know, progressive things have a tendency to happen in big groups. And I liked how the crow was. And I was perfectly okay with the crow turning into the dragon. The dragon really should have been Maleficent, but because the motivations for the entire movie were different, it wasn't as necessary that Maleficent become the dragon. Because this is not, now you shall face me, O prince, and all the powers of hell. This is, okay, we need to get out of here alive. Diaval, I'm trapped, I'm about to black out, turn into a dragon. Please. Dragon. I was like the first time. Human. And the dude's like, oh shoot, what the heck did I- Witchcraft! Yeah, fairy craft, but magic all the same. Close enough. And yeah, I saved your life. You're now going to serve me. You will be my wings. And this time hearing that line, I went straight to the animated Thumbelina. Oh? I've the never actually- s well, I may have seen it, but I don't remember it. Yeah, there's this whole song, Let Me Be Your Wings, I Will Be Sung Between Thumbelina and the Prince. Oh. Huh. Because she doesn't have wings. <laughs> so the prince is saying, let me be your wings, I will be your wings, I will be there for you. And then she says, I need you to be my wings. Since it was my second viewing, my brain went there. Ah. And... I'm pretty sure I stated this a couple minutes ago. I was perfectly okay with the high cheekbones and stuff like that. She's supposed to be fey. They are known for having very angular features, looking very non-human, but also very beautiful at the same time. Yes, my only thing with Maleficent's design was her pre-dark design. I'm like, she just looks more like a hawk girl. She didn't really scream fairy to me. Hmm, I can see that. Though I love that the horns are actually, you can see that they're horns. The animated Maleficent, you didn't know if it was part of a headdress. But now we know for sure, at least in this version, they are actually horns. Mm-hmm. Very nice designs. I like the alterations over time, how she has like different versions of the costume throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, things progress over time. I like that she has an actual motive for cursing Aurora, because that's always felt very weak in Sleeping Beauty, in all versions of Sleeping Beauty. You didn't invite me? I curse you. Yeah. Oh wait, I have a better idea. I'll curse your newborn child. 
Yeah, it's a firstborn daughter. I I would think that the royal couple would be more upset if it was the firstborn son. Mm-hmm. Though we do get the classic crazy king. We get two of them. Oh, yeah. The first one was a little nuts, too. Yes. The first one who decided that they should invade the Moors and said, okay, whoever avenges me gets to marry my daughter and become king. Ah. And then Stefan chooses to betray Maleficent to get that position. Yep, to gain power. Greed. Greed gets him throughout the entire movie. Yes, which is really too bad because he was doing so well in the beginning. He gave back what he stole. He threw away his iron ring so that he could be around Maleficent, whose name unfortunately does not make sense for the nice guardian of the Moors that she is in her childhood and adulthood up until the point that she is injured and betrayed. So I could have stood it if she had changed her name after, if she'd had a different name and then taken on Maleficent as a use name. Mm. But it doesn't really fit for the guardian and protector that she was in her youth. Hmm. Maybe it means something else in Fey language. Could be. Though I don't know what that is, and I think there actually is an actual Fey language in the books. The, you know, the old fairy tales that fairies actually come from. I do like how at the end it was actually the king's castle that they were invading and stuff like that. Even though in the original it was the castle, but this is like a whole different thing because it's actually the king putting up iron thorn bushes. Yes, and we still did get the traditional thorn bushes because there was a wall of thorns separating the human kingdom from the moors. So Maleficent put up the wall of thorns and King Stefan put up a wall of iron thorns. And I really like the effect they used for the iron and how it reacted to Faye. It actually just heated up and burnt them that way. Instead of the iron itself, even if it's cold, burns them. This actually shows it heating up and reacting to Faye. Which may have just been a visual cue so that we could understand, because it's always referred to as cold iron, that when you mark the Faye with cold iron, they are marked for life. Mm. Even if it is just a visual thing, I like the idea that the iron is chemically reacting to this particular species being nearby, and that's what causes the burns. And Yeah, which actually makes sense. Oh my goodness, logic in a fairy tale. I know, right? Did Catgirl survive us watching this movie? <laughs> I'm not certain. Hmm. Well, it was a live-action movie, so it wasn't anime, so we weren't bringing physics and logic into anime. Oh, so I think the Catgirls are safe. Hmm. Okay. Now on to your highlights, nitpicks, our thoughts on the Honest Trailers video. Uh, the Honest Trailer video has a lot of good points because there is basically nothing in the live action one that correlates to the original animated Disney Sleeping Beauty. Except Philip's design, they got the color of Philip's horse is right. We, we can't get Philippe right, but we can get Philip's unnamed horse correct. We had the blue dress for Aurora. We never had the pink dress. And almost nothing with Prince Philip at all. And more with Aurora, but more through Aurora's childhood. And less in her pending adulthood. Because the animated Disney Sleeping Beauty was basically all about the fight between Maleficent and the three good fairies. Aurora and Philip were just tools and foils to that end. Because even though Philip was the one who killed Maleficent, he did it with the sword and shield that he got from Flora, Fauna, and Meriwether. Who had name changes in this one? Mm-hmm. And were kind of mentally neutered. Uh, yes. A great deal worse at being humans than they were in the animated because they weren't that great at being fairies either. Yeah. Also a nice touch, not all three of them got to give their gifts and the third fairy didn't use her gift to change the curse. Is Maleficent after she went beg. I like that you begged. Do it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really like how Angelina Jolie played Maleficent. Yes, uh, especially the dark Maleficent. 
don't be afraid. I'm not afraid. Then come out. Then you'll be afraid. Mm hmm. Yeah. And again, the whole action speaking louder than words. Because, okay, yes, Maleficent cursed Aurora, but she watched out for Aurora her entire life. And Aurora was able to, even though she was hurt when she first found out, she was able to balance one harmful deed against an entire lifetime of being protected. Yeah, I really like that. Especially with the whole true love thing. It She really grew to love Aurora, which is a true love. When people think true love, they always think romantic. That's not the key. Love has many facets. And many forms. And it's a nice way to turn the fairy tales on their side because, you know, there's the devoted love of siblings. There's love between guardians and their charges. The love that occurs between best friends. See Morgan and you in Ember's reading room. Mm -hmm. I'll see if I can't put a little dot up in the corner. I don't. YouTube, stop changing stuff around. <laughs> uh, so there are many facets of love other than romantic and carnal love. And it's nice to see that represented. Yep. Especially with the love of, uh, what was the crow's name? Diaval. Yeah, Diaval loved her too. And it wasn't romantic. It was like very parental as well. Yes, because he'd been looking after her because he was working remotely for Maleficent. And so he was hanging around keeping an eye on her. And because of the gifts she was given, she was co so kind and gentle. Because one of the gifts was that everyone who meets her will befriend her. Oh, yeah. So that could have been part of what happened to Maleficent. Because the young Aurora came up to Maleficent and demanded to be held. And Maleficent did say that no one could change the curse or alter it. And she didn't put any limits on who it would affect. She just said, everyone. That was one of the three fairies' gifts. Her gift said, yes, all this will happen, but... So she reinforced the first two fairies' gifts. So that she would be a beloved icon that died. Because if she just had killed the child right then, yes, people would have been upset, her parents would have been upset, but once there's those connections, so it was really a terrible curse. And in reemphasizing that no one could undo it, so even though it was her own magic, she couldn't undo the curse. And you could see the difference in the color of the magic because everything she did in dark magic Truly dark magic was the green of the animated Maleficent. But when she was trying to remove the curse, her magic had more of the golden light that you saw when she was just punking the three fairies, or when she was doing protective stuff or mild things when she was still good. Yeah, I think that's based on the emotions it comes from. Because the green only comes out when she's being mean or using revenge or very angry at something those very negative emotions is when it turns green mm -hmm. but when she's being playful or trickery it's more of that orange color of what she was showing near the beginning of the movie of using yes which was even the color of her protective magic when she took on the first king mm -hmm. like the how they bring up the point of how iron hurts fey with her not being able to touch the armor well we get it shown to us several times because we get told oh, yeah. flat out that iron burns fairies because Stefan throws away the ring and then we have it reiterated that the soldiers are armored in iron yeah and i completely forgot about the ring like you said even though you mentioned it earlier everyone went what oh yeah it's it's still a subtle way of showing us that this hurts Faye. Mm -hmm. and it's a nice way to subtly bring it along into the very end of the movie where oh Giant metal thorns. Interesting. Yes, giant metal thorns and the iron net and all the iron shields to surround her with. Mm. Though I did make the comment of like, how convenient that they have fireproof shields. Then I remembered, oh yeah, they're making iron everything so they could trap Maleficent. Yes, but iron shields wouldn't be fireproof. They would get hot. Ooh, yeah, very hot. 
So if fire hits those, they're going to have to drop them because of the heat. That's why if, usually in the Sleeping Beauty tales you get a glass sword and a glass shield. Though that's not what Prince Philip got in the animated one. He just got magically created slash reinforced items. Yes, but traditionally it's glass. Ah, that's way too fragile. Stronger than you think. Also still magic. Ah, magically enhanced glass, I can see that. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, let's see. Did we go over it? Have you gone over all your nitpicks or have you even started on that? No, um, King Stephen's... Stefan's descent into madness, the fact that the wings were still alive and that she actually gets them back, it's kind of disturbing. Yeah. Yeah, it was almost an anticlimax in a way. It's like she suffered by losing them and getting them back. It's kind of like, I have the Dragon Balls. I just wish them back. Kind of felt like that. Yeah, it's kind of like the movie's Magical McGuffin. Even though there's a lot of magic in this movie, those made her more powerful and made it easier for her to get away. Well, it didn't seem to diminish her magic at all that she lost her wings. It just reduced her mobility. Because if you notice, she didn't seem to have as much trouble with the iron afterwards. Because the iron chain was wrapped around her foot as she was dragging King Stefan along. Hmm. But we didn't seem to see a reaction of burning. But we know that it burned her when she was still winged because we saw it early on in the movie. And we know that that chain was iron because he was using it to harm her when she was trapped in the circle of shields. And I remember her reacting to pain when it wrapped around her ankle and the special effect of it glowing was there as well. Yes, but after that there was no additional reaction because we were moving on and having the action mm -hmm. sequence and... I know Aurora didn't really know her father, but also Maleficent is semi-responsible for his death. It was a falling death, classic Disney hero death of indirectly responsible because she, Maleficent let the king go, both kings, and both kings couldn't let it go. If Stefan hadn't attacked her that final time, he would have lived, though he probably would have continued to attack the Moor this time to get his daughter back because Aurora would have gone with Maleficent willingly. You know, the man she's known for all of three seconds. And locked her in a room almost immediately. Or the woman who has watched out for her her entire life. Even though she cast a death curse on her. <laughs> but yeah, I'm just bringing up the other point of like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a very forgiving nature to get over that, but... When you add in the fact that Maleficent was the one who woke her up. Ah, uh, I think it's also the fact that one of the gifts is for her to always be happy. Yes, to never be blue. Do you know how difficult that would be to always be in the same emotional state? Yeah, if you really think about it, you can't always be happy. Even if you're always happy, there would be a point that you would forget that I was happy. Because it's your baseline state. If your emotional state never changes, how do you have a parameter for anything? Mm -hmm. You have no contrast. Humans live in that contrast. That's why it's hard to explain to people the concept of like, yeah, you can't be happy all the time because you would eventually not be happy. It's... Kind of hard. It gets kind of confusing at that point, but if you really think about it, you hit this point where you're always happy and that becomes normal. So you're no longer happy because that's normal. That's your baseline. So in a, its own way, that was a curse as bad as the other because now she's always set to be in a flat emotional state. Though she did show some range in the movie because she got upset when she found out Maleficent was the problem. She got upset when she was locked in the room. So she can get upset, but I think it's just she gets thrown back into that happy state. Or it's easier for her to go back to, I'm happy. Yes. And I think she was unhappy in those points specifically for plot purposes. So perhaps the phrasing of the gift wasn't fully thought out in terms of writing the script. Because your main characters need to have emotional range. And that's one of the things about Maleficent and I'm talking about the movie as a whole here as well as the character, motives give you a lot more into a character. I mean, I'll agree with Honest Trailers. It's part of what ruined Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the fact that 
Lucas didn't have any editors for those three movies. I have a feeling if we had editors for those three movies, the backstory for Anakin Skywalker, aka Darth Vader, would have been a whole lot better, like how the new movies are coming out, because they have an entire writing team on those movies. Yes, well, The Force Awakens basically felt like a new hope redone, and we're doing this to prove we can make a Star Wars movie. That was basically what it felt like. But I like it when villains have motivations, that they're not just randomly evil. As much as I love the original Maleficent, she's just evil. Yep, though she is that kind of evil that you really like to see in a movie. She's just evil enough and powerful enough that she can push the hero to his limits without it feeling unfair, without it feeling like the hero is not doing his job. I know, but then you have... For all its flaws, Disney's animated Hunchback of Notre Dame has plenty. I love to hate Judge Claude Frollo. Yeah, he's another type of villain that I really like because he's powerful, but he also shows that he's human because of what makes him evil. His motivations, as you said, why he does these evil things and why he kept Quasimodo around because he felt Guilty to just kill the baby. Well, he was going to, but the Archdeacon guilted him into sparing the child because basically he put the fear of God in Judge Claude Frollo of, do you see what you have done here? God saw what you have done. I like villains that are powerful that make me want to hate them, but I hate the villains that are powerful and make me hate them because the hero is not doing their job. The hero is always getting beat. The hero is always losing. I'm like, that doesn't make me like or hate the villain. It just makes me annoyed at the hero and the villain for not doing their jobs. Yes, and it makes me want to create my own character and start writing fan fiction to take down the villain. Mm-hmm, because he's way too powerful. I don't mind villains who are powerful enough that behind the scenes are always manipulating stuff, but the ones that blatantly are way too powerful than the hero and always beat the hero back, even though the hero can defeat all of their minions. But back to the fact that Maleficent, in this movie Maleficent, is a very well-balanced character and is very human because she can be either good or bad. Yes, her actions are shaped by circumstances, that she has reasons for what she does and she can regret her actions, accepting that she lashed out in anger and lashed out at the incorrect target and that she tries to fix it. That's very human. That makes her surprisingly relatable. Where King Stefan, he can also be relatable, but he's mainly relatable in the darker aspects of human nature because he's introduced as a thief. He seems to be redeemed because he befriends Maleficent, but then he betrays her for power, marries another woman for power, goes to attack the Moors to maintain his power, and ends his days as a fiercely crazed and paranoid man. Maleficent wasn't coming after him. The only reason Maleficent came to the castle was because Aurora was there. Mm-hmm, and she wanted to fix her mistake. So she was trying with Prince Philip. Yes, that was the only reason Maleficent was at the castle. If Aurora hadn't been at the castle, Maleficent never would have shown up. She would have taken Aurora to the moors, even if Aurora had pricked her fingers on a spinning wheel in the moors, Maleficent still would have been caring for her, would have taken Philip into the moors to try and get that kiss to work, and would have guarded Aurora's sleeping body for all of her days. Though I have a feeling at some point she would have kissed her on the forehead. Yes, no matter what, that would have happened eventually. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, everything is fixed. Oh my god, true love's real. Just not in the way I thought it would be. Yes. Because Maleficent phrased it that way because she didn't believe in true love. And I like how they arranged Philip's kiss this time. Because that's one of the things I always dislike in the Sleeping Beauty story is there's this unconscious woman that you don't even know or barely know. And you're going and kissing her. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to the original fairy tales, he does a lot more than just kiss her. It gets very um, rated R. Yeah, or X. Depending on how detailed you want to go. Yeah, and I really like how they made him very hesitant, and it was only the constant badgering 
of the three fairies that made him do it. He goes, I like that. What about the curse? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, just kiss her. Yeah, it makes Prince Philip a much more likable character that you know, everything we've seen of him has been very gentle and very respectful. Like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you back up. Here, let me help you up. And now that I've helped you up, I'm going to back up out of your space because I did not mean to disturb you in any way. I just was hoping for directions. Yeah, I'm kind of lost. This is a big, wild forest, so. Also, I'd like to point out that Diaval as a wolf looked better than the Beauty and the Beast live action wolves. And this movie's several years old. So, Disney, you knew how to do it back then. What happened? I think it was more budget and focus. The fact that the Beast himself was a lot of CG. So I think all the budget for the CG went into the Beast. So there wasn't a lot left over for special effects like the wolves and stuff like that. They also had to pump a lot of money into the set pieces of the characters, you should say, of Lumiere, Cogsworth, to make them look good. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of money per frame. Yes, it's very expensive. It's just that now seeing clearly that they could do it. Yeah, and speaking of that, I love the transformations for him and the whole, I, why did, I can't believe you did that to me. You said anything. Yeah, but not a dog. Wolf, totally different. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. I really liked him. I very much enjoyed Diaval, and it was nice to have the transformation for him. So he was truly more of a developed character instead of being the villain's pet cat, which is basically what Diablo is, is the supervillain's pet. Mm-hmm. The, yes, my pretty. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I think it added a lot of depth, and, you know, considering that most of this was the story of Maleficent's Previously unknown and probably never existed until the writers thought of it backstory. <laughs> I like your phrasing on that. <laughs> so, did we cover all the points we wanted to cover? Let's see. Horse was the right color. Uh, let's see. We covered how the fairies were made much worse idiots and how they didn't get to give all their gifts, but we didn't cover name change. They were not Flora, Fauna, and Merryweather. Hmm. They were Thistledown, which was the green, and then two other names that I didn't retain. I didn't retain any of them. There were more fairy-like names. Mm -hmm. I should say fae-like names. Than Flora, Fauna, and Merryweather. And we never got blue. Pink. <laughs> yes, because they didn't end up using magic and giving away their location because Maleficent has known where they were the entire time. So there was no need for that. Though I do think the cake was stacked blue, pink, and yellow. Yes, and... All lopsided, but unfortunately it still looked quite professional even though it was lopsided because that's actually a way of professional cake designers when they do the more artistic pieces. Hmm. Because, I mean, it looked like it had fondant and everything. It probably did just for a prop piece. <laughs> probably. Assuming it was real cake, it may have just been a prop piece. Hmm. Well, they've been known to use fondant in prop pieces too. Good point. Just because it's edible doesn't mean it can't be purely a prop. Not that you really want to eat fondant. It has, like, no flavor. Unlike ganache. Ganache is awesome. Fondant, just for looks. Yeah, not that much. I've had fondant. I'm like, this, this doesn't taste like anything. Are we sure this is made out of something? <laughs> no, it's just made to be edible so that you can put it over the cake. Yep. Sorry, I'll stick with the ganache, thank you. Preferably dark chocolate, if anyone's wondering. Yummy. Let's see, do I have anything else? Really enjoyed the movie, liked the special effects, thought the story was well done. Like Angelina Jolie as... Oh, her kids. Ah, yes. If I recall correctly, the infant was actually her child. And I know that the five-year-old Aurora was her daughter. Yeah, the only kids I think they could get that wouldn't go, ah! Yes, that were happy to see Angelina Jolie in a Maleficent costume. Because mm -hmm. they needed the children to be happy, and most children are going to run screaming from Maleficent. Good instincts, but not very useful for the film. Yep. So yeah, I think that now covers everything. <laughs> oh, please, we could go into so much more, but how long do we really want to make the recording? Because we haven't covered the designs of all the different fae. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, very nice. I like how the Fae Realm changed based on how Maleficent's mood was. Yeah, that her power was such that it affected all of the Moors. It was very Legend of Korra spirit realm, where the Korra's dark emotions warped and twisted the creatures. Mm. Also, the, I liked how the border guard still had her back and backed her when she went evil, because she had their respect, and they also cared for her. Because you could see in the battle with the first king, Balthazar makes that gesture referring to her injury. Just a silent exchange. But it showed that he was concerned. I also like how she gave him a compliment. Yes. Don't listen to him. You're classically handsome. I liked his design. I did find him quite handsome. It was a very nice design. Of course, being an artist, I can appreciate a lot of different things. Ah, so, final thoughts? I enjoyed it. Anyone who is looking for a shot-for-shot -shot live action of Disney's animated Sleeping Beauty going to be hugely disappointed. For anyone who loves retellings and tweaks of traditional fairy tales, this was awesome. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Just so many things, even when I was going, Oh, plot device incoming! I was still enjoying it because I was like, Oh, yeah, I see where this is going. Ooh, I like where this is going. <laughs> This isn't going entirely where I thought it was going, but it's kind of going where I thought it was going. Because mm -hmm, there are times where I really enjoy seeing where the plot is going, and there's other times where I'm like, oh, God, it's going there. I think it depends on how well the path is laid out. Mm -hmm. So overall, I really enjoyed the movie, and it was fabulous. <laughs> Obviously, I enjoyed it if I was willing to watch it twice. <laughs> Obviously. So I hope you've enjoyed our thoughts on Disney's Maleficent. And this has been our thoughts on Disney's Maleficent. 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 <laughs> okay, I quit. <laughs> uh. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, share, comment, check out other videos. Our Saturday podcasts are more pop culture focused. We do have a few other Disney ones. We also have more story-driven series in Ember's Reading Room, which includes such classics as Serendipity and Little Golden Books, and the somewhat lesser-known Whisper the Winged Unicorn, back before they were called Alicorns. If you enjoy Lex's art, you can find more of it on DeviantArt, Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and I'm sure more coming soon. If you really like Lux's art and would like some of your own, check his commission link for pricing and availability. If you just really like our channel and are willing and able, we have both a Patreon and coffee. Patreon starts at $1, coffee works in $3 increments. Thank you.